Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to an Academy Science member talk. My name is Christina and I'm your host for the afternoon. And we're so glad to have you here to learn about some exciting new research with Academy Curator for Pathology, Dr. Raina Bell. Uh, today, we're talking about the tiny, adorable cookies, frogs of Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico is home to 17 species of these frogs, but unfortunately, some species are already considered extinct and several more are vulnerable to future habitat loss and climate change. Dr. Bell is part of a multidisciplinary team of ecologists, climate scientists, and natural resource managers gathering data to help inform strategies on how to help these iconic frogs. And she's here with a project update about their recently wrapped fieldwork and some new exciting genetic data results. So I'd like to welcome Raina to the stage. Hi, Hello. Raina, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Christina? Good. Um, so, yeah, I I heard there's going to be some a lot of cute cute frog pictures, and also we're going to be talking about DNA today. So get ready to ooh and awe and also learn a little bit. Um, yeah. And so uh, we'll be doing a Q a short Q and A session after Dr. Bell's talk. So if you want to ask questions, just drop them in the chat, or you can use the Q&A function, and we'll get to them later. So without further ado, I'll let Raina take it away. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, all right, so like Christina said, today we have some new results of our work on Puerto Rico's Koki frogs. And just to sort of um, set the stage, this is where the island of Puerto Rico is situated. It's in the Caribbean and it's um, a few thousand miles southeast of Florida. The island of Puerto Rico is about 300 square miles in itself. Um, it's a little bit larger than the state of Rhode, Rhode Island. Um, for anyone who hasn't been there before, like me on your first, you might be a bit surprised to learn that Puerto Rico is actually very mountainous. And um, so it's a very rugged landscape and it has a very large mountain range that sort of spans across the middle um, of the island. And so the island was first inhabited thousands of years ago by indigenous peoples from South America. And then over the last 500 years or so, uh, Spanish and now U.S. colonial expansion, the landscape of the island has changed dramatically. Um, and that's mostly been due to the expansion of plantation monoculture and timber harvest, which at its peak removed more than percent of the island's habitat. So this is a landscape of more or less what habitats cover the island today. There's quite a dry forest type which is this sort of lighter green color on the map. Um, and then some wetter forest habitats at higher elevations. This is the sort of darker green color that you see on the um, But most of this forest is actually recently in forest just over the last uh, 80 to 100 years or so. Uh, and so this scale of habitat loss um, is very, very dramatic. And habitat loss is also a key threat to biodiversity um, for species all around the world. Um, and so clearly the island of Puerto Rico and the biodiversity that inhabits the island is no exception to this rule. Uh, and so here, this is just a list of names of all the frog species that occur on the island of Puerto Rico. And now I've highlighted a subset of these species in um, and does anybody want to take a guess as to what species are? And I think Christina is going to be on the spot because I think she's the only one who can answer me. So Christina, what do you what? think that these yeah. green species are? The light green species, I think, are all the frogs. So is that what you're? All of the species the on this species? slide are all frogs. Okay. And the sort of turquoisey ones, they were all turquoise before. And now I've uh -huh. highlighted a subset of them 
Madame Green. <laughs> um, and this subset of species is all the species of frogs on Puerto Rico that are considered vulnerable and deemed critically endangered. So it's a pretty staggering number of the total. Yes. And then don't leave because I have another question for you. Okay. Uh, and now I've highlighted a subset of the orange and guesses as to what these species are. Probably the ones that are either extinct or, or very, very close to being extinct. It's a very good guess. These are actually introduced and in invasives. Oh. And so when you take this all together, what you see is that the native frog community of Puerto Rico is really in trouble with mm -hmm. 14 of the 19 native species considered of conservation concern and 13 of the 17 native coqui species considered of conservation concern. Um, and some of those species are already considered to be extinct because nobody has seen them for decades. So it's a pretty dramatic and sad situation, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's the end of the quiz. <laughs> um, and so this context uh, of sort of the state of the frog island of Puerto Rico is really the motivation for our work. And we're bringing together scientists with different expertise to collect data that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, which is tasking biodiversity uh, in the U.S. and U.S. territories, um, but so that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service can use this data to inform habitat conservation and adaptive strategies to help recover the Puerto Rico coqui uh, frog community. Uh, and so the main questions that U.S. Life has that we're helping to answer are and the adaptive capacity of coquis to environmental stress. Uh, in particular, they're very interested in how different coqui species are likely to respond to climate change. Um, so what sort of breadth of temperature and precipitation conditions that they can withstand um, and whether different species are going to differ in their responses to future climate change and whether populations of species might be more vulnerable or more resistant to, to future climate change. Um, the second question that they have for us is what are the centers of genetic diversity in each of the coqui species, and especially for species that have more distribution, so just sort of patches of population separated in, in different parts of the island. Um, how connected or isolated are these different from one another? And we can use genetic data to help us get at that question. Um, and then sort of the overestion, bringing together data from the first two questions and all um, a better understanding of how climate is are likely in the future on Puerto Rico, when and where should Fish and Wildlife and other management agencies uh, be focusing their interventions or their efforts, like uh, efforts to protect certain habitats or even in extreme to start thinking about translocating populations of frogs. Um, and so really their big question is when and where should they be focusing these efforts to have the greatest impact? And what I think is really exciting about this work overall is that really the goal is to act now um, so that we have the information we need to end these species becoming critically endangered in the future. And that's exciting because the sooner we act before the situation dire, um, then the better chance we have to actually implement strategies that will have a big impact and sort of reverse the decline of these species versus waiting and when there are only a few individuals left. Um, so that's the good news, um, but it's still a very complex 
challenge because we know that the climate and landscape of Puerto Rico has changed quite a bit. Um, and we also know that there's going to be future change, especially with respect to climate this island. Um, and so what we're really trying to do is plan for the future in terms of which habitats are most set aside for these frogs to have a chance to adapt under the climate scenarios of the future. Um, and so that means that we have to have a good understanding of how climate is going to be across the island. And it also means that we need to have a good understanding of how the frogs themselves will have the ability to adapt as their surroundings change. And so that's really the crux of the question. And so my role on the team is leading the second aim. So trying to understand what patterns of genetic diversity are for each species, that information to identify critical habitats to protect, um, including potential migration corridors between more isolated populations. And in, again, this more extreme scenarios where wildlife managers might need to be prepared to translocate frogs um, from less good habitat to habitat that will be better for the frogs in the future, um, use genetic um, make those about which populations they move and where they move them to. So what does doing this type of work actually mean? Well, first, our team has spent about two years collecting genetic samples of a bunch of different coquille species all across the island. And in our sampling, really trying to capture variation in the different habitats or land cover that the species found in, and also, uh, different elevations and temperatures and precipitation uh, or sort of annual rainfall uh, that, that occurs on different parts of the island. And that's been, again, to understand sort of the range of conditions that different species can survive in. This site here in pink is where our team is collecting physiology data uh, from a bunch of these of coquilles. And here they're looking at the range of temperatures and humidities that frogs from different species and from different elevations uh, can survive in. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to combine their data about the physiology of these different frog species and different populations within a species with our genetic data so that if there's a genetic basis, they're able to cope with hotter or dry, drier climates that we'll be able to detect this with our coach of physiology data and genetic data. So finding all the frogs uh, has definitely been a learning curve for me, not people on our team who are very um, experienced Puerto Rican herpetologists. For me, getting good at finding coquilles took a little time. And one of the reasons is that coqui frogs don't have tadpoles. So instead, Cookies lay their eggs, and here you can see um, one of the Puerto Rico species. This is actually a species that lives in caves uh, in the southeast of the island. It's called Eleutherodactylus cookai. Um, but so here you actually see a male guarding a clutch of eggs, and a baby frog will venture out of that egg directly. So they completely skip the tadpole life stage, um, unlike most frogs that probably you're familiar with. And so what that means for all, coquille frogs are less tied to water than uh, most species of frogs I'm usually looking for. And so typically, if I am out looking for frogs, I'll be headed to a pond or stream, and then I'll start searching for frogs sort of in the of the pond or stream. But coquille frogs, can be found in all different kinds of habitats and they don't necessarily need to be close to water at all. Um, and so for me, it just took a while to figure out what the right search image was for a habitat likely to be found in. And another reason um, that doing this field work was a bit challenging 
for me is that Koki frogs actually look very similar to one another. So although I've just been telling you about all the species of Kokis that there are in Puerto Rico, 17 different species, um, they can look very similar to one another. So there are some differences in bodies and in iris color between species. So this species on the left here is the, the red-eyed koki, and you can see it has red. Um, but for the most part, kokis are small brown frogs. One of the best ways to tell them apart is actually based on differences in their songs. And so I have a couple of recordings here to play for you just to show you two different songs of kokis. Um, these are actually two songs that sound pretty similar, and this is just so that you understand a little bit of the challenge that I faced when I was trying to find these frogs and tell them apart in the field. And so this is the song of the Linkoki, um, and it's maybe one that you're familiar with, especially if you've been to Puerto Rico or if you've been to Hawaii, because this species has actually been and is well established in Hawaii. So that's the classic Koki song. And then this is actually the song of the red-eyed Koki, Chilean Koki. So it sounds pretty similar. Another name for it is the Churi frog um, that sounds Supposedly, it sounds more like true than koki, but it's very subtle the first times you hear it, and then eventually yeah, you start to hear the differences between them. Um, so anyway, two years of fieldwork uh, trying to find all these different species of frogs across their entire distributions, across the entire Puerto Rico, uh, trapping field sampling portion of this study. And we've started to collect some genetic data from our samples in the Academy's Center for Comparative Genomics. Uh, and so I'm gonna share some of the results for one of the species with you today. So one of our focal species in this project is the Coqui Llanero or the wetland Coqui. And then the newest Puerto Rican Coqui to be described in uh, So it was formally described in 2007 and when it was discovered by Puerto Rican herpetologist Dr. Neftali Rios Lopez, it was only known for a single wetland just outside the capital city of San Juan, this little area shown here with a star on the map. Um, and so this is a species new to science and only known from a single location. And so basically, as soon as it was formally described, um, it was eligible to be listed under the Endangered Species Act, and it was formed as endangered in 2000. And so as part of the listing decision, um, when endangered species listed, Fish and Wildlife will also prepare a recovery plan. And the reason for that is the goal of listing an endangered species is to implement a recovery plan plan so that they can be delisted in the future. Um, it makes sense. I didn't really realize this until I started working on this project, um, but the really the goal of listing species under the Endangered Species Act is to direct resources towards reversing the decline of that species, really with the ultimate goal of delisting it in the future. Uh, and so for the Coqui Llanero, the species recovery plan has three main goals. Um, first, to ensure that there are three viable populations of the species that are stable or increasing in size. Um, and so the Coqui Llanero, it's kind of a unique situation because it's only known from a single place. And so if this really is the goal for the recovery plan, then it probably will need to include uh, entrance to suitable habitats so that there are assurance populations and that we don't have one population on wetland the entirety of the species. That would just make it so vulnerable to 
um, a catastrophic event, wiping out the entire the entire species. And then related to that is for the habitat of the population to be protected in perpetuity. And then finally, for any threats or potential cause line to be reduced or eliminated. Um, and in the case of Pianero, a number of potential threats, including invasive species like larger tree frogs, uh, like Cuban, which is an invasive species, or cane toads, um, or any of the other number of frogs that I showed you that are introduced to the island and that have big mouths, uh, potentially eating this very small frog species. Um, and then on the habitat side, any modification to the wetland habitat or pollution to the wetland habitat um, could be important threats for this species to, and to eliminate. So right as we were starting this population in 2019, Something really exciting happened, which is that a second population of the species was found in a wetland outside of the city of Arecibo, about 40 miles away from the original site um, that the species was described from in Savannah Seca. And so this was really great news for the species. Um, first, because we already had two uh, of having three populations uh, of the species identified. And because it suggested that there could be other small patches of wetland habitat across the northern coast of the island that the species might still be persisting. And so as continued searching for other populations uh, in little patches of wet between and Sabana Seca, they haven't found any additional populations, uh, but they're they're still searching. It's, it's kind of hard to tell from this Google map view, but there's a lot of land use change and development across this part of the island, um, and whether there really are going to be more suitable wetland sites for this species in between Arecibo and Savannah Seca, um, but we'll definitely be continuing to search. And so, again, one of the key goals of the species recovery plan is for there to be three viable populations of the species that are stable or increasing in size. Um, and so we can use genetic data to assess the uniqueness and the health of the two populations, including whether or not they appear to be interbreeding with one another, um, which we can estimate based on shared genetic diversity between the populations, and also not the population increasing, decreasing, or stable in terms of the number of breeding individuals. And this we can estimate based on the patterns of genetic diversity that we're seeing within each of the populations. And so these data are an important first step to prioritize the in the plan for the species, including the action and mitigating threats or causes of decline. So to do this work, we have to get samples of the species. And like I've been mentioning, this species lives in wetlands. And wetlands are a pretty challenging habitat to work in. So in this photo on the left, I'm showing you prime coquillanero habitat. Um, this is just right off the side of the road that goes along the wetland of Sabana Seca. And you can see that the plants are very, very dense. Um, and what you can't see is that if you step off the road and into the plants, the water will come up to your ankles or higher. And you also can't see the swarms of those that also call this wetland home. So we go out uh, to sample the coquillanero. We suit up. Here I'm wearing and I've covered my arms uh, to minimize the number of mosquito bites that I'm going to get. Um, and then we wait for the sun to go down because that's when the frogs will start to come out and hopefully start singing. And then to a sense of what we're looking for on the right, see me holding a full-sized adult male coquillanero. So these are one of the smallest species in the world um, and they are what we have to find in this dense wetland uh, habitat. 
Uh, and so here's what they look like when we find them. So you can hear a couple other coqui species calling in the background. Maybe you can hear the common coqui. Um, and then this little yellow in the middle is the coqui anero. And it has a much quieter call than the other coqui species that it lives alongside. Um, so this combination of features really made me appreciate why the species wasn't discovered until 2000 <laughs> um, and why it's been so to collect new data on this species. OK, so on to some of the results. Um, so our collected genetic samples from both Arecibo and Sabana Seca. And with the help of uh, some science interns here at the Academy, generated genetic data in the Center for Comparative Genomics and, um, and results. So on the right, we have what's called a haplotype network of a mitochondrial DNA gene. And these figures are a nice way of showing the genetic diversity in a population. So I'm just going to walk you through what the figure is showing. So each circle represents a unique genetics in our data set. And the size of the circle indicates the number of frogs that had that identical genetic sequence. And then the segments that are connecting the circles represent how many genetic differences there are between different sequences. And then the colors indicate where the frogs came from. So Arecibo in blue or Sabana Seca in red. And so in the case of the Coquillanero, we have 11 unique genetic sequences in our data set of 27 frogs, seven sequence types found in Sabana the red ones, and four found in Arecibo, the blue ones. None of these sequence types are shared between the populations. Uh, and so this is already a promising sign that there's genetic diversity within each of the populations and that there's unique genetic diversity within each of the populations. So mitochondria is inherited maternally because it's transferred to the offspring through the egg and not through the sperm. So it's a useful first check to estimate diversity in population history in species, but it doesn't give the complete picture. So the nuclear genome is inherited both maternally and paternally. So half of the chromosomes come from the female and half come from the male. The nuclear genome also houses most so it's important to look at genetic diversity in the nuclear genome if we want to assess the genetic health of a species or population. Uh, and so we've done that as well. And so this figure across the bottom is the results of a clustering analysis where each vertical bar is an individual frog and the color represents the confidence with which that frog was placed in either the Arecibo or the Sabana Seca population based on its genetic diversity in the nuclear genome. And so often these types of analyses will look a lot messier. I'm going to show an example of a mess in a moment. But what we can see here is that individual frogs were placed into one or the other population with very, very high confidence. And this is consistent with the mitochondrial DNA network, which indicates that the populations are genetically unique and they don't appear to be interbreeding. So here's an example of a messier plot from another species that occurs on the island of Guadalupe in the Lesser Antilles. So the Guadalupe forest frog is a very widespread species on the island. It can be found from low elevations all the way up to the peak at over 1,400 meters elevation uh, on the Soufriere volcano. And so if we look at genetic clustering in this species, with samples from sea level to elevations all the way up to the top of the volcano, we see that the frogs at the extremes, so at low elevation and high elevation, that have strong assignment to either being the green population or the yellow population, 
but that frogs at these intermediate elevations have mixed assignments. So this pattern is an indication that there's migration in between populations, which will produce this gradual transition from one genetic group to the other. And what this typically means in terms of the landscape is that there's suitable habitat connecting these different populations so that migration is possible. And so in terms of the Guadalupe forest frog, the plus would suggest that there's good connecting sea level up to the top of the volcanic crater and that these frogs are easily moving between habitats and interbreeding with populations at different elements. So again, what we see in the Coquillanero on the island of Puerto Rico is a very, very different pattern. Um, and that's not too surprising because these populations are separated by over 40 miles and it's not that there's suitable habitat that's connecting these populations um, that would enable individual frogs to disperse between them and reproduce with frogs and uh, the neighboring population. Um, so a very, very different result, but maybe not too surprising given what we know about the landscape. Um, we're still stages of our analyses, but the next step will be using methods that can estimate whether the Arecibo and Deca populations are stable, declining, or increasing based on the genetic data that we've collected. And we're taking similar approaches with the other coqui species that we've sampled across the island. Um, again, really focused question of what are the centers of genetic diversity in each of the species and how connected are populations. And these data are going to help U.S. Fish and Wildlife understand when and where they can focus to have the biggest impact in recovering these species. And in the meantime, uh, there are ongoing efforts in Puerto Rico to grow awareness and support about the local coqui species, especially the coqui um, and left some newly installed lines at Sabana Seca alerting uh, people in the to the endangered species that they chat with. And then earlier this year, there was a campaign by Frontier Airlines where the public was invited to vote on which endangered species are on of, uh, the Frontier plane. And the Coquillanero won the contest overwhelmingly. So soon, this uh, very humble little coqui is going to be featured on the side of an airplane, which is pretty cool. Hopefully that will draw a lot more attention and awareness to this uh, endangered species. And so that's what our team has been up to. Um, there's still a lot of work to do, and I think especially start bringing together the data sets from the different so bringing together the physiology data with the genetic data and the climate modeling data, um, we're hoping that we'll be able to provide some really important insights to U.S. Fish and Wildlife to help recover these species. And so be happy to take any questions and uh, I hope, hope you learned some new DNA things, but also got to see sufficient number of cute frog photos. Uh, thank you so much, Raina. I saw a sufficient number of cute frog photos, I think. <laughs> so hopefully all our viewers did. You can let us know. Um, but uh, so so the Koki, are they, there's questions about their songs and calls. Mm -hmm. um, are they named after the sound they make? And, and what do they use those songs and calls for? Great questions. Yeah, so... The common coqui, which is the one that makes the song that I think sounds like coqui. I can play it again here, just so we're all on the same yeah. page. <laughs> so that one, and that's the one that everyone in Puerto Rico knows that frog. And most people who have been to Puerto Rico know that frog because they're everywhere and their song is really loud. Um, yeah. And a lot of people who live in Hawaii 
or have visited Hawaii also know this frog. <laughs> I think from what I understand, people in Hawaii don't love them, <laughs> but people in Puerto Rico. Um, so yeah, so that one I think is named for the song, but then the other species um, don't necessarily make a koki sound. So there's one species, for example, called the whistling koki. Okay. And that sounds more like whistling. And then the koki llanero, which has more of like a pink, pink. So, yeah. Um, and in all these cases, it's just the male frogs that make the song. And they make the song to attract mates. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from the crowd, or the, sorry, the, the audience. Um, could you describe the physical collection and genetic sampling techniques that you use in the field? Yes. Um, so for these species, um, we, we did collect whole animals. And typically we wouldn't, we wouldn't necessarily need to do that, but in this case, because the frogs are so tiny, we can't get enough genetic material with a non-lethal mm -hmm. uh, sampling method. Mm -hmm. um, and so we capture whole individuals and then we euthanize them and prepare them as voucher specimens for future study um, at the University of Puerto Rico and here at the Academy and then also to collect a genetic sample for genetic analysis. And those and those specimens are kept so that scientists in the future can use them again mm -hmm. for, for more research, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. yeah, we I think for it's it's the type of science that we do here at the academy. Um mm -hmm. and I was hesitant about collecting whole animals of the coquillanero, of course, because um, it's an endangered species, but they're very locally abundant at mm -hmm. the sites where we find them. And so our Puerto Rican colleagues who have been studying these populations since they were first discovered um, and who have a really good sense of the local population size and abundance felt very confident that us taking a few individuals out of the population, especially removing males, wasn't going to have a negative impact on the, the local population. But that was definitely a conversation that we had. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, and then a question, uh, could you talk a little bit about the Cokies, maybe the specific Koki um, that you were talking about, their life cycle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very so interesting about the tadpoles or lack thereof. <laughs> yes. Um, I think for most people, it's kind of mind blowing because when we learn about frogs in school, we learn about the life cycle and the tadpole and metamorphosis. Um, and so mm -hmm. there are actually lots of different species of frog all around the world that skip that tadpole life stage. Um, and the coquis are just a very successful group of frogs that have done that. So there are hundreds of different species in this group and they all skip that tadpole stage. Um, and so they, the adults, they lay the eggs. It's still like a, a humid environment. Um, so the eggs don't have a thick shell like a reptile egg would. And so they still can dry out. So they need to be placed in a humid environment. Um, but, and some species have guarding, um, like in that Eleutherodactylus mm -hmm. cookai. So the male is sitting on the nest, which is also very cute. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And what's really cool, I think, is that the because the eggs are transparent, you can actually like see inside the egg and oh. see what life stage they're at. And so wow. the later stages of development, it really is just like a mini version of the adult frog that's all sort of... Oh bundled up inside the egg and then they'll hatch out and they'll just be a miniature version of the adult and ready to hit the road. That's amazing. Um, how many eggs do they usually lay with one cluster? Is it fewer than the species that that um, 
have tadpoles or or do you know generally yes but not necessarily um so okay. like yeah <laughs> There's, there's thousands of species of frogs, so there's yes. like exceptions yes. to every rule. But um, toads tend to have tons and tons and tons of eggs. That's one of the reasons that the cane toad has been such a successful invasive species is that one female can lay thousands of eggs. <laughs> um, but then there are species that have tadpoles um, but that, especially the species that provide parental care to those tadpoles. So a lot mm -hmm. of dart frogs um, provide parental care to the tadpoles. Like you might have seen photos of males carrying baby tadpoles around on their backs. If you haven't, you should go. I also. haven't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but those species also have smaller clutches or fewer offspring at a time because okay. they're providing care to them. And so there's only so many that they can care for at a given time. But in general, yeah. species that have development of an egg will lay fewer of them because they're mm -hmm. sort of like more energy intensive to produce. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, oh, Fred has a comment about Hawaiians not liking the Cokies as much. <laughs> Um, reads, my understanding is that many Hawaiians are unhappy with the introduction to the islands and consider their song just to be noise. Have you heard the same? Yes, I think, um, again, it is very, very loud. So <laughs> it can either be like a fond memory of home. Like I know um, I certainly miss the song when, when I come home from doing field work and I have a lot of Puerto Rican friends who say when they're not home mm -hmm. in Puerto Rico, they like have a hard time falling asleep because they don't hear the cookies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it is very, very loud. And so if if you don't like the sound, then yeah, it's probably a nuisance. Mm -hmm. And it's also different if you know it's an invasive species versus if it's like mm -hmm. to your island. So yeah, yeah. Um, and then what kind of role do the cookies have in in the ecosystem and what do what do they eat and what eats them? Uh, yeah, so generally frogs will eat whatever fits in their mouth. Um, but for <laughs> real, and they're, they're carnivores, um, the adult version. So tadpoles are often eating like in, <laughs> in water um, that is more like plant material, but adults are usually carnivores. And keys, because they're small, most of what fits in their mouths is insects. Um, so they're mostly eating insects. And, but larger frogs can eat larger things like other frogs. Um, and so that's why some of these invasive species like the Cuban tree frog, which mm -hmm. is much bigger than the coqui, could be a problem because a coqui will fit in its mouth. And so it will eat, <laughs> it will eat cookies. Um, but in terms of native predators, those would probably be, there's a lot of um, small snakes in Puerto Rico and um, probably birds would eat them as well. And spiders will also eat frogs. Um, so like larger spiders, if they get their hands on a frog, it's a good meal. Yeah. Um, and then more questions about the eggs and the eggs. So are the eggs laid in the water or wet mud? And are there any cookie populations that um, aren't in wetlands? Like, is there, because you mentioned mm -hmm. that, you know, not having tadpoles means they're not necessarily tied to water. So yeah, one, yeah. First question is water, wet mud, and then other types of landscapes for other species of cookie frog. Yeah, so yeah, so they don't lay their eggs in water. Um, they will lay them in like on the wet, damp soil. Um, they'll mm -hmm. lay them bromeliads, like on the leaves of bromeliads, oh, yeah. kind of mm -hmm. like that. Um, I think also sometimes the male frogs like the bromeliads because it kind of amplifies their song. So it sounds <laughs> loud. They'll often find like yeah. a little crevice or something that really amplifies the song. Um, so yes, not in the water, but often near a place that is wet or humid because the eggs do have a risk of drying out 
um, if mm -hmm. it gets too dry. And then in terms of what types of habitats you can find them in, um, they're very, very successful at living in all different types of habitats. So the Coquillanero is the only one that really has to be in habitats. Um, as far as we know, mm. the only two sites that we've found them. But um, like in the recording that I shared with you, there were other coqui frogs in that habitat with the coquillanero. So some of the species mm -hmm. that are more wide can live in wetland if they want to, they can live in dry forest, they can live in wet forest, they can live in your backyard. <laughs> um, so some of the species are really nice and they can live in all kinds of habitats, uh, including really modified landscapes like in the middle of San Juan. Um, and so yeah. that's partly why we think the common coqui has been successful as an introduced species in Hawaii is that it was able to mm -hmm. stow away probably on some ornamental plants um, and then uh, it just right. yes. it got to Hawaii. <laughs> yes, yes. All those bromeliads traveling exactly. to apartments. Yeah. yeah. And um, especially because they like to on the bromeliads, so. Yeah. Oh yeah, so you're just bringing this, you have lots of frog eggs and you don't even know it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, so now that you know the two populations from Sabana Seca and Arecibo are completely separate, is there, what's kind of the next step? Like, what do you do with that knowledge? Yeah, so in a way it's good because it tells us that there's like, more sort of evolutionary potential in the species. Mm -hmm. So usually if there's more genetic diversity, then a species or a population has better chances of being able to adapt to change. Mm -hmm. Like just by chance, there's more likelihood that some individuals in the population will have traits that are better adapted to the new situation, whether that's like a change in climate or um, a new disease, like a pathogen that hits the population. Mm -hmm. um, and so just having different genetic diversity in the species is kind of a good starting point in terms of mm -hmm. thinking about um, either captive breeding or introducing populations to other wetland habitats on the island to make more assurance mm -hmm. populations. It just means we're in a better starting point in terms of the options that we have moving forward. Um, yeah, because often when species are endangered, there's very little, there's very, very few individuals left and very little right. genetic diversity left in the species. And then you're kind of mm -hmm. in trouble in terms of your options. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and then finally, I just want to say congrats to Bori the Koki, <laughs> the Koki on the frontier plane. Do you yeah. know what other animals, animals it beat out? Um, I mean, I'm not surprised. I should because I voted. <laughs> I feel like the like cookie you just had eyes for the cookie was definitely, um, I would say, like the most humble of the endangered species. Okay. I want to say there was so. an endangered parrot and, you know, more of like the types of species mm -hmm. that tend to get all the attention. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's kind of nice to see a, a cookie win. But I also think. Yeah that a lot of Puerto Ricans voted. And the Coqui is kind of the national icon for Puerto Rico. Yeah. And so I think there was some some pride and like, we have to win, it has to be the Coqui. <laughs> I love it, I love it. I love that, I love that organization and pride. Um, yeah, it's a very well, strong, positive culture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no wonder you like it there so much. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for, for joining us and, and telling us about this work. It's it's super interesting. And I imagine you have a lot more work to do that you can hopefully update us on when you have more genetic yeah. data. Yeah, I'm excited. Like I was saying, I'm really excited to see how the physiology data will mm -hmm. map with the genetic data. And if we can see like certain species or certain populations already have that ability to withstand drier, hotter climates um, and whether or not we can actually find the genes that are giving them that increased yeah. tolerance. <laughs>
that'll be really cool. Yeah. So, but we'll see. I don't know yet if it's gonna <laughs> if it's gonna play out. So, but yes, I will be yeah. more than happy to give a follow up once we're there. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, um, thank you so much to our members for joining us this afternoon. Um, we hope you you shared some or you learned some cool new things that you can share with your friends and family about cookies. And yeah, thanks for being a NEP member and have a good rest of your day, everyone. Bye. That was really cool. Yeah, it wasn't too that. fancy. No, I thought it I thought it was I thought it was really like kind of the perfect level um, of science, honestly. Science with a purpose, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. And I really like the kind of like the three the three point structure, you know, like what the goals are of or, or how to get something delisted as an endangered species and like um that was cool uh and also obviously my greatest fear so when you like asked me those questions i flashed back to elementary school where like i would get called on and i would just like my brain would just like, go i mean it was just a bunch of scientific like, things so it was a hard question yeah. <laughs> but question. anyway i was just like I was like, mostly, I was like, I don't have time to find photos of all of these right now. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and some of them are extinct, so there is no photo. Okay, um, yeah. But, yeah, you did great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, that was, that, was, that was really good. Um, yeah, I love oh, when people are they you? just want to know about, no, sorry. You what? Oh, I just love when people are just like, oh, I just want to know more about like their life cycle and the babies and what they eat. It's always I the mean, questions. Yes, I know. I was yeah. like, I so. should probably put more cookie natural history in here just because I was like, I'll talk about the eggs. That's like a thing that if they've learned one thing today, it's that yeah. not all frogs have tadpoles and I've done my job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. But, oh, I wanted to ask what, so you did not leave us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I did not completely leave um, because, yeah, Laurel's like, if you just want to stay on doing projects that you like, 